As a concert pianist, the question I'm most often asked is, can you recommend a good teacher for me? Conventional wisdom on learning focuses mainly on repetition. As a child, I can remember playing piano duets with my brother and being promised a prize if we play the duet a hundred times nonstop. We didn't realize that the mindless repetition was reinforcing our mistakes. Fast forward to one rainy afternoon in London. I was sitting in class as a graduate student at the Royal Academy of Music when my professor grumbled, I can't believe students will spend a fortune on the tuition here, and then they fail to read this book that they could buy for a few pounds. The book he was referring to was The Art of Piano Playing by Heinrich Neuhaus. I'd love to share with you some of the ideas in it. I can sum them up in a educational a formula of Neuhaus's, which is cold reason and a warm heart. By a warm heart, I just mean that we should use a warm heart to set a meaningful goal for ourselves. And then by cold reason, uh, I'm referring to the principles of technique building needed to make the goal a reality. To set a meaningful goal first, because meaning is the driving force for technical development. You can't build technique in a vacuum. In my case, hearing a recording of Rachmaninoff playing his own piano concertos gave me a goal and a sense of meaning because I wanted so much to recreate something so beautiful. Having first used the warm heart to set a meaningful goal for ourselves, uh, then we can move on to using cold reason to make the goal a reality. I've broken up cold reason into five parts. Relaxation, concentration, repetition, conservation, and creativity. Firstly, we have to remember to relax because we tend to tense up when we gear up for hard work and then it becomes impossible to play the piano quickly or with finesse. You can try it for yourself and see. Just like it's impossible to swing a tennis racket or a golf club and generate power if we're tense. Piano technique consists of constant alternation between effort and rest, just like the heart that beats nonstop or the lungs that inhale and exhale. As pianists, we need to concentrate and think ahead in order to put our fingers at the most favorable position at every moment. The more that we focus mentally, the less we have to physically labor. I'd mentioned repetition as being overly emphasized, but it still deserves a spot on our list. Developing a muscle memory is necessary for the strongest and the weakest talents, so this puts us all on an equal footing. The legendary pianist Franz Liszt would repeat difficult passages hundreds of times, so there was no chance of error in performance. Fourthly, conservation. We need to have a willpower and go straight to the goal as far as possible, not making any unnecessary movements. Neuhaus says this in a great way. He says, uh, don't bring out your heavy artillery to shoot sparrows or use a toy pistol against a battery of guns. If you have perfectionist tendencies, as I do, you'll find this advice to be particularly helpful. If we get stuck at a difficult passage, we can use creativity to turn it into an exercise until the difficult becomes easy. With a certain amount of thought, everything tricky can be reduced to something more simple. Practicing methods include varying touches, hands, rhythms, speeds, in every way that you can think of. And if you're not feeling creative, Try playing the passage one way and then in the complete opposite way. Play it really fast and then too slowly. You can syncopate even beats and then syncopate the odd beats. Hands in position or hands crossed. Trill, uh, just using the wrist and fingers still. And then keep the wrist still and just trill with the fingers. And then when you put it together, it feels really easy. Uh, my favorite trick that I learned from Neuhaus is if you have a really hard passage, um, first play it with all the motion in the finger and then keep the arm and wrist as still as possible. And then do it the opposite way. So keep the fingers still and all the motion here. You do that for a few minutes and then uh, play it normally and it feels magically easier. I'll never forget how excited I felt the first time I tried that. This way of thinking applies to our daily lives, too. Neuhaus calls this the kingdom of the dialectic. Canis Seymour Bernstein has a solution for stage fright. He says we should be more nervous. Likewise, some therapists will encourage the deliberate practice of a neurotic habit in order to identify and remove it. 
For instance, patients with insomnia trying to force themselves to stay awake. Or say in a debate, if we're forced to defend the opposite side, we're going to understand the issue much better. Thinking in terms of opposites can even help for composing. The most famous example of this is Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini, the 18th variation. Rachmaninoff took uh, Paganini's theme, which you may have heard, etc. And then to so this, he flipped, or in music it's called an inversion. He did the opposite, like a mirror image. So that just became and then he put that in a major key. And then that became uh, one of the most famous melodies of classical music. You can go on the internet and hear Rachmaninoff playing this himself. We shouldn't think of mastering a skill as this big mystery when it can be explained through this formula of cold reason and a warm heart.